Brock David Tebbett is probably a name you don't recognize, but I'm sure you would recognize the artwork of Joe Average. It's cheerful, colorful, cartoony figures. There's a telling juxtaposition between his upbeat art and the very difficult life he has lived after being diagnosed with HIV AIDS in the 80s. He is one of the early survivors of this deadly disease. If there's one thing you're not, it's average. So how come you're called Joe Average? Mm, okay, this is a good story. When I was a teenager, here in, I was in Victoria. When I was a teenager, here in, the, here in Vancouver, there was a group of artists that all worked out of this one old warehouse that they named the Western Front. And they all had crazy AKAs there was Dr. Brute, there was Lady Brute, there was Mr. Peanut, there was Sally Peanut, Flaky Rose Hips, Granada Gazelle. And I wanted a crazy art name like them. And I tried a few out and realized I didn't, I was a very insecure, I, I didn't have much self-esteem. And so I didn't think I could pull off a crazy art name. And so I gave it up. And a couple of months later, uh, I was with a friend, an artist. Well, she called me up and she said, Joe, I found a box of old magazines from the 50s in the alley. Want to crack open a bottle of wine and just look through them? I went, yeah, because in the 70s, that's what you did, right? Anyway, we're flipping through and every once in a while, I come across a piece of advertising. And back in those days, they used a lot of clip art. Now, when I say clip art, it's usually like the standard drawing of a, the milkman and the postman and the policeman all were the same guy and the, the wife and the nurse and the telephone operator were all the same lady. And I kept on saying, oh, it's the average Joe and average Joe. And after a few glasses of wine, I said it backwards. I said, Joe average. And we both looked at each other and went, that's it. I went, it's perfect. An average height. I do average in school. I'm just average. I said, and it plays perfectly with my sense of humor because it kind of is self-deprecating because I had no self-worth in my body. So it kind of just introduced me perfectly. So why is that, that you were feeling so insecure as a teenager, I guess, or perhaps before that? What was it in your upbringing? Bringing. What was happening? Well, I knew that I was different from my brothers. I, had, I was the oldest of four children. And my two younger brothers were very athletic and liked beating each other up all the time. Um, I liked just watching the Academy Awards. So I knew I was different. Um, I knew that other people could tell I was different and said horrible things to me, so I knew, I thought there must be something wrong with me. And so that's where the insecurities, and I just started hiding, and I thought, if I don't speak, or if I don't, if I keep my mouth shut, maybe they won't n know that I'm whatever it is they don't like. Because I didn't even know what gay was <laughs> when I was a kid, you know? I. I thought it had something to do with the fact that I thought that Paul McCartney was cute, but I wasn't too sure. So I was a little bit confused, but was pretty sure it had to do with, some, with that I got weak in the knees over pretty boys. Uh, so high school was rough? It was horrible. I just did a thing with a, yesterday, as a matter of fact, I did, I was a human library at Moss Grop Secondary School in Burnaby which was a fantastic experience. It's a chance where people from their community, diverse people, come and sit. So, you know, the, one of the kids said to me, what is it, 
I can't remember how he asked the question, but I said, when I was in secondary school, all I did was hid because I got beat up on a daily basis. I said, when I come up to your school and I first thing that I see is a rainbow sidewalk into where your parents drop you off, I see rainbow flags in your hallways and you're all inclusive. I just, I've been to that school twice and Zoomed with them once during COVID and every time reduced to tears at just how much better the world is going to be because of these smart kids. I told them, I said, you guys are going to fix what we f***ed up, right? <laughs> Whenever I get a chance to talk to young people, I pull out the soapbox and tell them the dangers of HIV and AIDS and tell them that just because it's not on the news anymore doesn't mean it's gone away. You mentioned HIV AIDS yeah. and it's so woven into BC's history in particular from the 80s on yep. be because of the epidemic here. Sure. Um, your personal journey, your health journey mm -hmm. is also tied into that. How did it come to be that you went in and you were diagnosed with HIV AIDS? An old friend of mine, I said, do you have a GP? He says, yeah. And I said, is he gay friendly? Because, you know, HIV and all that. He goes, yeah, he's gay friendly. He's a gay guy. And so I, uh, he became my doctor. And he's first there, he said, we're asking all gay men to give blood samples. It's a voluntary thing. You don't have to do it. We're just testing for HIV. And I said, absolutely. And I gave him my arm and. He said, come back in a week, and I came back the next week. He rolled his chair up to mine, and he put his hand on my knee, and I went, oh, shit. Here it comes. And he said, you have tested positive for HIV. And so I went into survival mode instantly, and I went, okay, what does this mean? How long do I have? And he said, well, it's so fresh and young and early, we have no idea. I said, you could have six weeks. You could have six months, six years, you could live the rest of your life. I went, that's the one I want right there, that one. Anyway, so. How did you feel? Well, I was good. I mean, I didn't have any symptoms or anything, and I was 27. And I went along just fine for three years. Uh, they had me on, all that was available then was AZT and a broad spectrum antibiotic. And the AZT, people were just dropping like flies on AZT. And the antibiotic was just to ward off any opportunistic infections that might start in because of your diminished immune system, right? And so I managed to get through that. Uh, well, when I turned 30, three years in from the diagnosis, all of a sudden somebody, somebody walked up to me on the street and go, are you okay? And I said, why? And he said, you look really skinny. And I just hadn't even noticed the change. And I'd lost about 20 pounds. And I looked gaunt. And I had AIDS. And we just kept doing ACT. And, and I managed to hold out until 1996 when the first cocktail came out. Oh, happy day. I actually did a painting with a hand with the new pills in it called Bright Future because all of a sudden there was hope for us, right? And I did the image for that conference. That So the conference that I did the image for was the conference where they announced the new cocktail. It was awesome. When the conference started, the room was black, and from the ceiling started lowering this image, this quilted image of my painting in quilt, and the audience erupted, and my life has not been the same since, because I was at one of my shows, a fellow came up to me and said, 
my boyfriend and I just came back from a trip in India. We we're driving in this rural area, middle of nowhere. This lady had a little stand on the side of the road selling her wares. She was selling embroidered clothing. And we had to stop because right front and center was your image of One World, One Hope. So it, went, it, was, it put me on the map. Before you came to that conference, then, mm -hmm. you had been through early diagnosis, no mm -hmm. symptoms, uh -huh. and then trying the AZT and mm -hmm. trying various things. I'm sure Julio was using you as someone he oh, could yeah. test new ideas yes, on. Yes, we certainly did. Did you, during that part of your journey, ever figure, oh, this is it, I'm done? Quite a few times. Uh, um, just because of, this, of what was on the paper. I never went into a suicidal mode. I thought about it slightly once or twice, but I thought, come on now, where's your fight? <laughs> I have a very strong survival instinct in me. I think we all do. Sometimes people don't pay attention to it. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I have a pretty strong survival, but there have been, I've been through some side effects that would make the strongest of men shudder. Just things that you wonder how any human could ever endure. Can you talk about Well, there's examples? one, and I can't remember which, what this drug was called, because they all had huge armies <laughs> with more letters than should be in a word. Um, but I went, I was at my doctor's one day and I said, I think I'm going crazy. And he said, why do you say that? And I said, lately I've been having very horrible thoughts. I want to kill my cats. When I'm driving down the street, I want to mow down people on the sidewalk. I want to turn into oncoming traffic and cause an accident. What the f is going on? And he said, are you on this drug? And I said, yeah. And he said, didn't they tell you that it caused nightmares? And I said, well, yeah, I've had the nightmares. They said, didn't they tell you it caused daymares too? I said, that's a thing? And he said, yeah. And I said, I want off this drug now. And so they really scrambled because I was a different person. So it's a hard life. You know, people it's think, hard... okay, yes, HIV, AIDS, now we've got some yeah. answers for it. But really, it's a lifelong, hard journey. It is. Um, it, it's a, it, like I tell the kids, yes, you can survive with the drugs, but it comes at a really high cost. In 2011, you were diagnosed with lipoatrophy. Yeah. Can you describe what that is? Well, so I went to my doctor one day and I said, my face seems to be getting gaunt. What is happening? And he said, no one's told you anything about this? I said, tell me about what? What fresh hell now? And they said, well, long-term use of the drugs that you're on, the ARTs, in some people, they start eating your body fat. I was like, oh, to what point? <sighs> Till it's all gone. Is there anything I can do diet-wise or in my lifestyle to combat this? No. Oh, okay, what happens when there's no more body fat? It starts on your muscles then. Ugh. Anyway. It's moved down to your muscles now? It has now gone to my muscles. I'm trying to keep walking as much as I can so that my legs stay as strong as they can. But hmm, from my calculations, I kind of think I'll be full-time wheelchair in a couple of years. Uh, just because I've noticed lately that at the two block mark with the cane, the burning is happening again. So I kind of have a timeline a bit. I've figured out my own little timeline. Um, so I'm always trying to prepare for my future. So 
about five years ago, I was here with a friend and I was talking about it. I was a bit worried because I only had enough money in the bank for about three more months' rent. And I think I was telling her, I'm starting to panic a little bit. And she said, tell me again why you're not on disability. I said, I'm not disabled. And she said, can you sit on a chair for eight hours? I said, no. She said, can you stand for eight hours at a job? I said, no. She goes, honey, you're disabled. And I went, okay. And my friend was telling everyone that we were applying for disability for me, finally. And Olive said, has Joe applied to Wings? And everyone said, what the hell is Wings? No one knew what Wings is. And so I applied and I got approved. I only have to pay about $300 a month out of pocket for this apartment. They pay $1,400. It's been so important the way you have opened up about how difficult mm -hmm. your life has been and what the ups and downs and triumphs are. Mm -hmm. And for other people to hear your story, it gives them strength and, and hope to carry on. I think that's a wonderful gift that you're giving back to society. When I got that six-month diagnosis when I was 30, I thought, how do I want to spend these last six months if that's all I have left to live? And the only thing that I ever got any attention for occasionally was my doodles in my little journal. Because when I hid, I always hid with my journal, my little repeatograph pen, a little pen and ink, and doodles all the time. And so I thought, well, try that. And so my boyfriend at the time was an elementary school teacher. We were both poor as hell. And so I, my medium was chalkboard chalk and charcoal on school issue newsprint. And so I did little drawings and pinned them to the wall and had little shows and people actually bought them. So from the start, was your art the art that we know, which I think of as um, cheerful and bright and colorful and cartoonish? I stylized it over the years. It got slick. I found slicker ways to make it work. I never went to art school, so... How would you I... describe your work? Pop art. That's the only thing I can compare it to, I guess. Um, pop art and First Nations art were my first inspirations. Like when I saw pop art, I went, that's art. I could, that's awesome. I thought it was too cool. Now, when I was a kid, I loved watching telethons. I was a weird kid. But there's those, that little scroller at the bottom, Mr. and Mrs. Smith just donated $100. I wanted to do that, and I couldn't. But I found out that my art could. And I was like, okay, this is win-win. So anybody that asked for a donation, I was like, yes, absolutely. I know how to draw. I'll draw something and give it to you, and you can make some money and help you. Did you ever have any idea you'd be so successful as an artist? Well, no. And at the very beginning, when I challenged myself, I also was co cognizant? That's the right word. I said, do not do this with any expectations of fame or fortune. Just do this to survive. Keep a roof over your head. Um, and it's been 35 years. And, and I've survived. Not only survived. The I went the right way. <laughs> the, I chose the right path. The huge mural. On Granville Street. So they called me up and they said, we want you to do this big, huge thing on Granville Street. It's the, it's the uh, 40th anniversary of HIV AIDS. And I said, okay, wait a minute. Are you guys expecting me to create a new image for this? And they said, yes. And I said, no, I'm not interested. And they said, what, wh wh why? And I said, you want me to try and outdo myself? I've already created an image which is, which is synonymous with HIV and AIDS and has been since the beginning. I am not going to try and outdo myself. I can't. I said, you can use that image or I will not do it. And they went, mm, 
what kind of thing. So they went, okay. Two days later, they called me back and said, okay, we'll let you use the image. And I said, good. When you talk about your art and your life, and I don't know if you're in a meditative state these days, but when you look back, mm -hmm. what advice would you give to young people? That is a really good question. Um, what have you learned? You know, I've had the opportunity to talk with teenage students a lot, and they're just figuring their way out through life and not quite sure what path they want to take. So a piece of advice that I offer, and I just say, take this and just keep it in the back of your mind, but whatever you were really good at as a kid, or whatever you liked the most, explore that, and you might find your pathway. I said, you already have it all in you. You just have to figure it out and go with it. And take leaps of faith. Don't play it safe. Be smart, but take leaps of faith. And is that why you say to me, you're really embracing being gay? The, the yes. nail polish, the pearls. And yes, I'm embracing being gay. I figure if I'm preaching it, I better, I better walk the walk if I'm talking the talk, right? So I'm proudly wearing the nails and the pearls and um, being my authentic self. Um, I have, you know, I, I'm so happy to be alive at this time in the world's history. We can walk into a store, buy pot legally, see a transgender woman on the cover of Time magazine, and see boys walking down the street hand in hand. How happy am I to see this in my lifetime? The world is changing for the better, finally. Thank you, Joe. Well, thank you, Carol. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Joe Average, not average, a BC legend. <laughs>